Hi everybody, welcome to This Week in Medicine, September 27th, 2021. Remember this is brought to you by the Fox Hall Foundation. We have an actual location that is not our office. It's the Fox Hall Wellness Center in Chevy Chase. Um, we'll have nutrition appointments likely in our office and at this location possibly. Uh, we also have yoga classes that have started, so feel free to go to our website and sign up. We're looking at uh, inviting some more people to come and teach classes. We'd be happy to uh, take any interesting uh, solicitations from uh, people who are interested in yoga, uh, other wellness classes, Pilates. Just send us an email and we're happy to review it. What stressed you out this week? Well, my inbox in the office said booster confusion. And this actually came from a lot of newspaper reports in particular. Interestingly enough, the patients don't seem confused about this. This was something that I saw in the headlines a lot in the newspapers this week. I didn't really have patients who had booster confusion. We've been talking about boosters a long time in our area, and I think we were all ready to get the booster for Pfizer. Air safety travel is still a big issue. A lot of people are still flying, going on vacation, planning holiday vacations. It's still tough, but I'd say we're a good mask. We're an N95 or a KN95. And if you want to try to time the booster, it's probably the same rule that we had for the first two shots. You probably will get maximum benefit about two weeks after you get a booster shot. So if you're trying to time it before you go on an airplane, that would uh, be prudent to think about the two-week time period it takes to uh, develop antibodies from even a booster shot. Flu shot, again, uh, a little bit of talk around flu season, but not too much. Flu season was so uh, small last year with a very small spike, the smallest spike in uh, recent times, uh, but still try to put it off until November if you can. Vaccine for kids, that data has been submitted for the Pfizer vaccine, which is a third dose vaccine for ages five to 11. We just are waiting for approval and hopefully that'll come in the next couple of weeks. That'll make a lot of anxious parents very happy. Long waits are still in the emergency rooms across the country. We've seen that. We've also seen potential rationing of care in places where there are high levels of unvaccinated patients, like in Idaho, um, where they really don't have enough room for the vaccinated patients who have other medical conditions that are not COVID related. Uh, how do you interact with the unvaccinated has been a question uh, that has been posed to me, mostly from people traveling out of our area because we have a high vaccination rate in our area. And then, the, of course, the J&J &J second shot, which keeps getting stronger and stronger data every week. This should be coming out in approval from FDA very soon. It is true that the original research on the J&J &J vaccine showed a significant impact from a second shot of J&J &J with protection that rivals that of the excellent Moderna vaccine. So hopefully that will be approved soon. The good news, we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, the Tuesday report from the World Health Organization, this past week's Tuesday report on September 21st did say that uh, COVID rates did continue to decline. So globally, COVID rates are still declining. There are some areas where it's on the increase. The largest increase was um, in the Western Pacific region. Uh, otherwise, the Americans, uh, America is doing very well. Again, I wanted to remind you, your protection for Moderna against hospitalization for a Delta breakthrough infection is 95% for Pfizer, 80%, and J&J &J still pretty good at 60 with a J&J &J, uh, second dose that will probably go up to 90 to 100%. Delta infection for a uh, breakthrough that leads you to an emergency room or an urgent care, again, the protection is excellent. So remember these numbers. Yes, boosters have been approved for Pfizer patients, but don't despair Moderna patients because your protection is still excellent. So the booster confusion from this week, there was a minor discrepancy, but for a healthcare provider or teacher, it was major um, discrepancy between the two advisory commissions, the one from FDA and the one from CDC. The FDA advisory panel said that uh, everybody uh, over 65 and healthcare workers should get a Pfizer booster. And then CDC said, well, maybe not. Maybe we should leave out healthcare workers and people who have close interaction with potentially unvaccinated people. Um, if you think about it, part of the reason that the CDC might have recommended against booster shots for healthcare professionals is that when healthcare professionals wear personal protective equipment, PPE, and wear N95 masks, our risk of actually getting COVID is very small. We don't have all the data from Delta 
period, but from the initial period from 2020, if healthcare workers wore their masks N95, if they wore personal protective equipment, they did not get COVID. In fact, most healthcare workers, if they do get COVID, get it in a community setting, but not at work. So it's possible that part of the reason that CDC said healthcare workers did not need a booster is because we are so well protected in the clinical environment, in our work environment, by the fact that we wear masks, which is yet another pro in favor of mask wearing. Uh, this kind of left out the teachers, though, who are with unvaccinated young kids, people under uh, 11 or 12 years old, bus drivers, first responders, and food manufacturing workers. They could still be in close touch with people who are unvaccinated. So although the CDC recommendation for not vaccinating those people may have made sense for the healthcare workers because they're protected, it really doesn't make sense for a teacher because teachers, for the most part, are probably not wearing N95 masks and neither are their students. So around one o'clock in the morning, I think it was, Rochelle Walensky um, decided that we would probably need to include healthcare workers, teachers, and uh, the extended category of people who work in professions that are potentially exposed to uh, unvaccinated first responders should be included in the Pfizer booster. So the recommendations are, first of all, don't mix your vaccine. If you were a Pfizer person, stay a Pfizer person. If you're a Moderna person, stay a Moderna person. Uh, there's more data on that coming soon though, because clearly there were people who got maybe the J&J &J vaccine and then wanted a booster with a Pfizer or Moderna. Um, and then there are even people who have had Moderna and switched over to Pfizer. Some of this was due to limited availability. I've had patients who were international patients who were only able to get one Pfizer. And then maybe they came to the United States and wanted to get a booster of Pfizer and couldn't, could only get Moderna. So this data hopefully will be coming out soon as well. So who should get vaccinated with a Pfizer booster if you started with two Pfizer shots? If you're older than 65, if you're in long, a long-term care facility and that's where you live and you're older than 18, if you have certain underlying medical conditions from age 50 to 64. So all of those people should get vaccinated. Underlying medical conditions would be immunocompromised conditions where you're on steroids like lupus, diabetes, um, heart conditions. So if you have a medical condition, you should get vaccinated. Uh, it's not even a question of may you get vaccinated, but it's actually being requested that you do get vaccinated because you are at risk. And then there's the category of may get vaccinated. So you can get vaccinated if you want to based on your individual risk profile. So 18 to 49 year old with underlying medical conditions, for example, a patient with lupus who's on steroids and may be immunocompromised. Uh, and 18 to 64 with the occupational institutional work setting that we mentioned before, if you have that setting where you're in close contact with people and that's part of your job and profession, you may get vaccinated. The secret sauce is still working in Maryland and DC. Virginia is not too bad either, but Virginia does not rank as high as Maryland and DC. So on the basis of data from last week, we're probably at least four weeks uh, into this trend that demonstrates that Maryland in particular ranks 50th in the seven day total per 100,000 people of COVID incidents and uh, DC is 43rd. So Maryland's been 50th for a long time. We are in a great state. Uh, I'm going to take a minute out from uh, COVID, which I'm sure you're all grateful for, and we'll discuss our sensitive friend, the pancreas. Uh, what I'm hoping to do is make a medical minute uh, every once in a while. Maybe we'll try and do this every week. Uh, Dr. Yamamoto and I have been talking about this. We wonder if it would be better if we gave a basic understanding on human biology to our high school students and uh, even elementary school students. When I did human biology in uh, high school, we didn't talk about the major organ systems. We didn't talk about what happens to the body as it ages. We didn't talk about sort of natural aging and the natural biology of aging, but maybe we should. Maybe all of, all of America would understand vaccination better and not be so afraid of it if we did a better job educating on basic immunology and how vaccines work when kids are in elementary school. It can be taught basically. So toward that end, Today we're talking about our sensitive friend, the pancreas. So the pancreas is this yellow organ right here. And you can see it does connect to the gallbladder, which is this little green guy. So the pancreas connects to the gallbladder and they share a duct system, which releases digestive enzymes, among other things, and insulin. The pancreas is actually located behind the stomach, surrounded by the small intestine. This is your small intestine, your liver and your spleen. So if you're worried, is my pancreas hurting? Do I have pancreatitis? Well, it's above your belly button. 
it's kind of up under your ribs. So when I'm looking at your pancreas or I'm examining your pancreas, I'm gonna go above the belly button, not below the belly button, that's mostly just intestines. So remember that, it's helpful when we talk about things by email or over the phone. So the pancreas makes digestive enzymes, digests your food and also makes insulin. I think we know that. Uh, when do these enzymes sort of cut out? When can you not rely on your digestive enzymes and your insulin anymore? Well, there are a couple of things, what I would call the three A's. Your age, as you get older, your pancreas does age. Uh, alcohol definitely decreases the ability of the pancreas, not just to make enzymes, but also to make insulin, which you need to digest your, your food and your sugar. And there's some anatomical things that happen to pancreas that are not super common, but there's a condition called pancreatic divisum where the duct system uh, can be anatomically different. And sometimes that difference can predispose, predispose to inflammation of the pancreas. And then there are some people who carry a recessive gene for cystic fibrosis. They may not have cystic fibrosis themselves, but since it's such a common genetic disease, if you're a carrier for a cystic fibrosis gene, you may even have a slightly sensitive pancreas. It's really pretty reliable in early life, so I'm not usually checking pancreas blood tests or your pancreas if you're in your 20s or 30s. But as it ages, blood supply is important and alcohol is important in aging your pancreas. If your blood supply is not good to your pancreas because you have plaque in your arteries, then that pancreas is gonna age faster. If you're drinking too much alcohol, you're aging your pancreas. There's a thing that's new in pancreatic health called an IPMN, and it's involved in cancer screening for the pancreas. I'll show you that slide in a minute. Uh, we talked about how it's connected to the gallbladder. You saw that it was connected uh, through the duct system. And then there are two blood tests that we tend to use, amylase and lipase. Uh, those are easy to check in the office. They check them in the emergency department. If they're worried that you have pancreas inflammation, those are the two blood tests that we're checking. Pancreatitis often is caused by alcohol, but it can also be caused by gallstones and uh, by things we don't actually know. So some people will get pancreatitis, sometimes from an underlying genetic susceptibility, uh, and sometimes we just don't know why you have inflammation of your pancreas, but you should look. It's not something where we just raise our eyebrows and say, oh, sorry, you got pancreatitis. It's worth a look. What's an IPMN? An IPMN is a term that I don't actually like. I don't like this term. It's called introductal papillary mucinous neoplasm. And what bothers me with neoplasm is when patients hear that, they think cancer. An IPMN is not a cancer. It's not the classic pancreatic cancer that we talk about when we talk about a terrible disease. Uh, IPMNs may progress to invasive cancer. These are like tiny little cysts that come off the branch of the ducts that I showed you on the pancreas. Uh, this is from the website from Johns Hopkins uh, Pancreatic Center. They have a pancreatic cyst clinic where they monitor the IPMNs. Many of you are involved with this uh, with me. We'll take a look, a look at your pancreas every year or two or three to make sure that your IPMNs are not progressing. As this website says, most IPMNs will never progress to a cancer. You can observe them and we can observe them by doing MRIs of your pancreas every year or two or three. Some patients are followed in the pancreatic monitoring clinic. Uh, I send patients to Hopkins and Hopkins soon will be uh, starting this clinic in our region, probably in January or February. Statins were in the news this week. This was a great editorial. I'm not referencing the article. The editorial itself was so good. This was with JAMA Cardiology. And basically the idea is that maybe we should be evolving our our understanding of plaque and atherosclerosis and how we're using statins to prevent plaque so just this one paragraph if you read it is really great this was just the beginning of the editorial the editorial says basically what we're using to decide if statins are working and when we start statins our 10 year risk of cardiovascular events rather than what we do in our office, which is the risk of developing atherosclerosis over a lifespan. And in our office, you know, we call that your plaque burden. So here's a picture of the plaque. See this pipe, it has plaque in it. That's what your arteries look like when they have plaque. It's not blockage that's the problem as Dr. Yamamoto says, it's this plaque buildup because if a piece of that plaque goes off, erupts or ruptures from that large burden of plaque, it goes down your bloodstream, it can go to your brain. If it cracks and bleeds, it turns into a heart attack. 
So the reason that this study was important is that it suggests that maybe we're looking too far downstream. Maybe we're looking at the end stage of plaque that we should start looking at how plaque uh, begins to build earlier in life. And it also mentions that we're probably starting statin therapy too late for a lot of people because we know that plaque starts developing even in your earliest years in your 20s and 30s. So instead of using endpoints of did you get a heart attack or a stroke, what's your risk of that for starting a statin? Maybe we should be asking what's your risk of developing plaque? What is your plaque burden? So this was encouraging because it reinforces in our practice the legitimacy and the benefit of looking at when you start making plaque. And so this was very uh, welcome to see. The North American Menopause Society meeting had its meeting September 22nd to 25th in Washington, D.C., I believe. 20% of women have migraines, so that's a lot of women. It's very common. Uh, the Mayo Clinic, in a study that was presented at the North American Menopause Society meeting, linked history of migraine with hot flashes and worst overall menopause symptoms, which is a problem. Um, because if you're trying to get rid of menopause symptoms and you give a patient hormones uh, to get rid of their hot flashes, sometimes that will make migraine worse. And in fact, this past week, I had a patient in the office who was started on a birth control pill at 52 to deal with her um, menopause symptoms. Within six months of starting that birth control pill to help her with her menopause symptoms, she got vertigo and head fullness. And she did already have a history of migraine. So chances are, even though we were trying to take care of her menopause symptoms, all it did was exacerbate her underlying tendency to migraine. And so she developed vertiginous migraine, probably as a result of taking hormones. So how else could we treat her migraine? Well, we could use non-hormonal treatments for menopause. Uh, sometimes Effexor helps or other medications, even gabapentin can help with hot flashes. And then uh, I reminded the patient to try and take her B2 vitamin, uh, 400 milligrams in magnesium, because if you do that every day, it can help with these hormone-related migraines. Uh, but the interesting thing from this meeting was the link between uh, migraine and worse overall menopause symptoms. So if anything, it just makes sense. The tip of the week from Tony. Um, I got a lot of these this week. Tony did too. I'm not sure if it's just because it's the end of the month. Uh, you get a lot of these. This one actually was mine. Hello, Kristen. Your doctor is not responding to your request for a prescription refill. We've been calling your doctor's office and they're not responding. This is generally never true. I don't know how CVS Caremark generates these um, warnings to patients or to myself or, or to anyone who is trying to get a prescription, but they're never true. I haven't found one yet that's true. Basically, it means that they have the wrong phone number, they have the wrong fax number, uh, you weren't actually due for your prescription yet. So in general, when you get one of these, look to see if you actually are due for the prescription refill. Look to see if it's on auto refill. And then just send us an email or call our prescription refill line because these CVS Caremark uh, alerts to you saying that we did not respond to a prescription request are virtually never true. It's generated from an electronic system. Fast pitch, uh, remember your new, new first age for first colon cancer screening is 45. It's not 50 anymore. Um, so I try to remind you this when you come in for your annual physical, but not all 40 year olds come in for annual physicals. So if you're 45 or older uh, and you don't even have time for a physical, just let me know. We can talk about colon cancer screening by email. Uh, the PSA is back in vogue for prostate cancer screening. For a while, there was research literature that suggested that PSA was not helpful for screening for prostate cancer, but that meta-analysis data was reviewed and it was found to be faulty because the patients who were the control population, meaning the patients that weren't being screened with PSA, actually were getting screened with PSA in their private doctor's offices, and it looks like PSA screening does make a difference for prostate cancer detection. Uh, don't trust your online pharmacy, as we just said, with refill requests because the online pharmacy may not be up to date. And finally, be kind to your pancreas. It's a sensitive organ. Again, the foundations of health. If you don't get your vaccine, your, your entire pyramid that you've been working so hard on your whole life will tip over. So even though we don't have this problem so much in our area, if you have friends or family across the country and they're vaccine hesitant uh, or just haven't gotten the vaccine, uh, tell them that really is crucial to their health. And the more data we have, the better that we know that these vaccines are working. In fact, the Lasker Prize in medicine just went to one of the developers of the mRNA technology this past week. There's our book. Thank you very much for your attention. And as always, I appreciate you uh, looking in on us and giving us 
uh, feedback and advice on further episodes. Have a good week.